Welcome to My Blockchain Island. I'm your hostess, Carla Marie. Hi everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of My Blockchain Island. And you know how sometimes I love to bring you like epic of epic guests? This is one of those episodes. Today I'm joined in the studio here with uh, Scott Scornetta. Um, thank you so much for it's coming pleasure in. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, Scott, uh, I, I really I really want the listeners to really understand who you are and why you are very significant to blockchain. Sure. Um, so I'm going to just let you sure, tell them. Sure, I'm happy to talk <laughs> just a little bit about it. Um, so it, one way of thinking about my connection to the blockchain is to go and read the initial Bitcoin paper. There are eight footnotes in the paper. Four of them are to work that I did with my colleague Stuart Haber. Where we really laid the foundation for distributed trust, and to us, we um, we contemplated some um, major implications that it could have. But it's really quite thrilling to see that it's had even more uh, development than than we imagined. And so, I used to, in fact, you know, I, you talk about being in those uh, references to Satoshi's paper. I, uh, over the years, have gotten a number of unsolicited emails and uh, letters saying, gee, I notice one that um, four of those eight references are to your work. I notice two that you used to be um, a missionary in Japan and so you're fluent in Japanese. <laughs> and I was just wondering, are you willing to disclose that you're Satoshi? <laughs> and um, again, um, let me just set the record straight on that point, <laughs> which is, Watashi wa honto ni Satoshi Nakamoto de wa arimasen. Okay. <coughs> I don't know how to say it any more clearly than that. Um, I, I assume what you said is that you're definitely not Satoshi. Definitely not Satoshi. Do you want me to say it in Maltese? Please. Scott Moosh Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> but I have great admiration for what he did. It was really a, um, a bravura performance, taking the materials that we had laid out and making it something of um, much greater relevance to people by choosing to move into the cryptocurrency space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a sense, when you think about uh, what money is, um, it all comes down to some record that's verifiable of the transfer of obligation. And when Stuart and I did the original work, and this was back at part of the old Bell Labs, mm -hmm. Bell Communications Research, we were all about creating an immutable record. And what makes it an immutable record is the interlinking of the documents and then the wide distribution mm -hmm. of that record. Mm -hmm. And in that way, creating a community of trust. Mm -hmm. But the reason that it got so much more attention with what Satoshi did was that he made that a financial ledger of trust with some exquisite incentive mechanisms built into it. Mm -hmm. Um, so much about building a successful platform or movement is all about creating those incentives, those incremental incentives that help the community grow. Yep. And he really hit it out of the park when it comes to that. And I think the timing also was very specific, right? It was. You know, we, st we, we started operating the first blockchain though obviously we didn't call it that at the time, back in 1995. Yeah. And many people are surprised mm -hmm. to hear, and that's something that's run continuously even till today. today. Mm -hmm. But many people are surprised to hear, you know, one of these kind of uh, chicken and egg pair boxes. If that's really true, why haven't I heard of it? Well, there's a way that you gradually get the word out. <laughs> but, um, you know, you're talking about a very different era. You're talking about dial-up modems. You're talking about, um, you know, limitations in storage and whatnot. 
and I floppy disk. Floppy disk. <laughs> the the point I'm making. Now my age is going to start it's, showing. It's, it's not. It's not a fully connected, high bandwidth no. internet world. And no. so the whole concept of creating a distributed record that you know Bitcoin, just to cite an example, is 200 gigabytes right now. Mm -hmm. That was simply inconceivable yeah. uh, for us. Yeah. And so um, we did make some early progress, but uh, certainly don't want to take credit for all the enormous flourishing of interest and intellectual activity that we're seeing in the space now. Mm. We're glad to have had a role in laying that foundation. Yeah. Another way to think about it is I, um, I often talk to people that are introduced as being this or that expert in the space because they've been in it since 2014 or even 2013. And, you know, I've been in it since 1989 and um, it doesn't make my view a superior one, mm -hmm. but it, it gives me a long-term view sure. about what's possible and what's really going to matter for the long run. And of course, that's what I talked about in my uh, address at the Blockchain Summit here in Malta, mm -hmm. the reason for coming here. Yeah. So what is, what is the future outcome? Well, one way to think about it is just to ask yourself, for the first time in history, we have an immutable record that all the world is a witness of. Mm -hmm. And so just ask yourself, what could I build on top of that? What could I build now that, in a sense, trust has been decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just to take a, a, a very tiny story, um, I, I guess I live an OCD kind of life. Mm. And so and I'm always... lots of spreadsheets in your life. And I'm... There's way too many spreadsheets in my life. And uh, I'm, I'm always worried that I will show up at the wrong place at the wrong time or without the right credential. Think about what happens when you have to rent a car, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, you call up the rental car agency, you say, I'd like to place this reservation, or you do it online, whatever. And, you know, essentially they say, okay, well, your, your uh, reservation number is ANQ365. Sure. But you think, what happens if I show up at the rental car place and I say, my reservation's ANQ365, and they say, well, we don't have any record of that. There's a huge asymmetry between you and the rental car agency. Sure. Um, whereas with a distributed ledger, we are, have equal standing. You know, it's, it's not my word against theirs, mm -hmm. and they're the big company and I'm the small the individual. individual. Mm -hmm. It's, here's what's on the chain, yeah. and there's no disputing it. Absolutely. And so that whole um, leveling of the playing field mm. creates enormous potential in a number of ways. Um, obviously, a lot of the early attention has gone into cryptocurrencies. And I think we're going to see more innovation in that space. But one way to look at it is, I remember in the early internet days, you almost could get a Rorschach test when you took people from a certain generation and people from a newer generation yep. and had them look at a primitive web browser. Sure. Some of the people would look at it and say, look at all that is wrong with this. Sure. Look at it, all that is too slow or broken or untrustworthy or insecure. Look at the range of uh, limitations that it has. And the other person's looking at it and say, don't you see that even in this very primitive state, there's already enormous demand. Mm -hmm. Think what's going to happen as we gradually work out the bug. Yeah. And so people that can see in an imperfect initial offering the potential for where that could go and, and why there's so much latent demand for the thing, even in its imperfect form, those are the people that can spot where the trends are going to go. And I think you're going to see that with cryptocurrencies. I mean, another way of thinking of it is that Essentially, <coughs> I apologize if I'm being American-centric, but in America we have the Federal Reserve. Yes. And they control they control how everything. The US <laughs> they control works. the printing. They control how in much is in demand. In a sense, we've all been shipped little, be your own Federal Reserve 
laboratory kids. Sure. And we can all play Federal Reserve. That's it. Does that mean that most of these efforts will be successful? No. You know, the vast majority of them will be unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. But the cat is out of the bag. That's it. It's the, it's the fact that the item's there to be taken, the opportunity's there to be taken. You're yeah. always going to have lots of people trying to take that, but out of that, that those people trying, there's, a, there's just individuals and collective abilities to explode that technology. It's very much there. Again, think of the foundation layer as being the, interlect, the interlinked records that are widely distributed. Sure. On top of that, the so-called design space mm -hmm. is very large mm -hmm. on three axes. Mm -hmm. Where should the computation be done? What should the governance structure be? Sure. And what should the incentive structure sure. be? And probably that last one is the most significant. Mm -hmm. Getting the incentive structure just right is what allows the mass for the, these the things to undergo mass yeah, adoption. Mass adoption, I it was going to say. It reminds me uh, of this joke that used to be told, and I'm dating myself because it's a mainframe computer joke. <laughs> anyway, the mainframe computer breaks down so they call in the repair person. The repair person comes in, looks at the computer, hits it with a hammer, and it starts working again. Mm. He sends a bill, $250. Sure. The guy complains, what are you doing? You, all you did was come in and hit it with a hammer. Mm. You know, I want an itemized bill. Yeah. And so the guy sends an itemized bill. He says, uh, hitting with hammer, $5. Knowing where to hit, $245. Sure. Fantastic and analogy. getting the incentives right is what this is all about. We've got an immutable record. We've got everyone witness. Mm. If we get the incentives right, we're going to create these e enormously important um, structures. structures. I know you're, you're quite passionate about the governance though side of things, the corporate governance side of things that you, you mentioned as being one of those three items as well. Right. Would you like to elaborate on what the governance part of it is? That, that, that well there's two aspects there. One is setting governance for new structures mm -hmm. but the other one and this is what originally motivated Stuart and myself in the original work was we were very concerned about shady governance in existing corporations mm -hmm. and institutions and how that lowered people's level of trust. Okay. And so I do have a strong interest uh, and we'll be announcing something uh, shortly in that space Wonderful. in the nonprofit sector for creating uh, ways of raising the standards of corporate governance. That's amazing. Uh, well, we see if we can't prevent a few, a few more scandals. That's good. That's good. Looking forward to that announcement. Maybe we can get the exclusive. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, just joking. Um, you, you're also chief scientist at Ugan, uh, Ugan Partners, correct? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on there? Well, at Ugan Partners, um, it's a private equity fund, and we're looking for opportunities to invest in the blockchain space really based on the fundamentals and the notion that if we can nurture uh, the right value creators in this space that we can have a major impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people often talk about the philosophy of the blockchain and I think, um, I think it's a wonderful thing, the whole democratization of things, the decentralization of things. And yet philosophy alone is not a business plan. No. And so we look for those people that have the right spirit of what they want to accomplish with the blockchain, but also good insight into how to create something that really creates immediate value. Mm -hmm. Because except for a few early adopters, very few people are willing to um, start using a new product or a new service because it feels good. Mm -hmm. It has to feel good. Yep but also meet a need. Yes. It yes. has to meet not just what we used to call, and I know you're, you've been in the VC space before, I'll take one must-have need for 10 nice-to-have yeah. needs. Yes. Uh, there has to be something so compelling. And so uh, we're all the, fu all the time meeting with great entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who think they have built a better mousetrap, and that's a very exciting thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
even more broadly, we hope to just grow the value in the space at large. Mm -hmm. no, no, do you no have a um, uh, do you have a specific investment focus? Are you looking at more tech centric type of uh, type of companies? Uh, I, I have a PhD in physics from Stanford, and what I like to say about that is it means that I may be ignorant, but I am educable. And so one would think that that would lead to a very technology-driven focus. Mm -hmm. But what I found is that, in fact, it goes just the opposite way. What you have to find is the compelling economic drivers mm -hmm. and then work back to decide what the technology solution is for that. And so while we feel like we have great depth, mm -hmm. um, myself and my colleagues, in the technology side, it's really more about being driven by the, the need, the consumer need, the business Wonderful. need. Now, I don't mean to be completely obscure in responding, so let me just offer a couple of, of, uh, <laughs> of specifics. I think there's great opportunity in um, bringing together uh, networks of players, whether that's uh, supply chain or any of a number of things, and essentially eliminating settlement, mm -hmm. the need to do reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And of course the reason that that's going to be the case is because there's only one record created to begin with. There's no such thing as settlement or reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And there are so many areas uh, across finance and other areas where those are still stumbling blocks. Sure. Uh, it's it's really hard to imagine why we have, for many large institutional transactions, T plus 3 or T plus 4 or even T plus 10, meaning once something closes that it takes 3 or 4 or even 10 days for it to become official. Sure. If it's all on a single record, there's, it's T plus 0. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of inefficiencies in that space, and we're going to see those inefficiencies uh, removed. Why not? Um, uh, again, I'm talking too much. Why don't you? Uh, <laughs> no, it, I, I could just sit here and listen to you all day. I mean, like, I, I, I got lost in your, obviously, I've been reading your, your papers, and I'm just like, okay, so You know, maybe it's one wonderful. thing that's worth talking about is how this actually got started, at least from my perspective. Yes, well, I, well, I highlighted actually a sentence in, uh, in, the, in your paper, the secure, secure name for bit strings. Um, because what I understood, and, and maybe I'm wrong, so this is a perfect opportunity to ask, ask you. Am I understand correctly that the ultimate, pro you looked at it from a problem solution perspective when, it, when this, was, this paper was being written, and ultimately what you were driving at is the secure, meaningful naming conventions that are being applied. And what, again, correct me, interrupt me if I'm wrong, what I really, really felt when I read, read these papers, which are obviously, as we said, they're referenced in Satoshi's paper, is that even though Satoshi developed upon what was written there, very much of the technical, like you're mentioning here, the private key, you know, the private signature key is indeed secure. A lot of the technical stuff, because lots of people say that Satoshi's paper is not, not very technical. Well, the it's technicalities are here. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, so for me, this is where I've got. Uh, I, I was r reading and reading. I was just like, well, really, this is why it's not so technical because he, he had a framework upon which to, you know, which to build. And then I got very inspired because I thought, okay, we've got the core of a lot of things there. We're still in the early days. Very it's much in the early days. It's going to come. The next steps are now just going to build upon it. You know. Right. I mean, one way to think about that, and let, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that you've raised. One way to think about it is that Satoshi's work was truly a bravura performance, but it's really just the opening act. Okay. In, in a sense, what's changing is we have enormous computational power and we have peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. And the question is, what kind of new world are we going to create on top of that? And these cryptographic protocols are able to redefine trust and association across that network. And so in a sense, blockchain creating an immutable record really is just laying the foundation. And there's going to be layer after layer after layer of value creation. Mm -hmm. And whether we have to call it blockchain or not, 
is is not a big deal to me. I don't. Uh, in fact, in your other paper here, you say there's more than one blockchain, and then you already start to evolve about different touch points around the. Let's call it the ecosystem. I love to use the word right. ecosystem. People are going to be like, Carly, you're always saying ecosystem, but let's call it an ecosystem. Again, one way to view success is when you become uh, subsumed in layers that no one even talks about talks anymore. About. We used to joke in physics that, uh, and this is probably overly geeky. Don't but, worry, uh, I have a few geeks following um, this channel. You know, <laughs> I, I worked in uh, theoretical physics and you know, what, uh, what you can do by smashing uh, <clears throat> particles together in accelerators was sort of the experimental half to what I was also interested in. And anyway, we used to say that, um, today, uh, uh, that tomorrow's breakthrough will become today's calibration signal, <laughs> okay, and yesterday's noise. And that's just the idea of no one talks about TCP IP protocols anymore, but they were hot at the time. It's just that because they've been so successful yeah. that they've become sublimated yeah. underneath. And so we're very much going to see a day where the whole blockchain thing has faded, not because it didn't prove important, but because it proved so important that it just became it an just underlying became infrastructure that no. we could all that's assume it. would that's be it. there. Yeah. And that's where you see this, uh, you know, additional layer of smart contracts and just a whole flowering of cryptographic um, ways to transmute associativity and trust and transparency, mm -hmm. along with privacy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, it's probably worth saying a word or two, though, about what really got us started. Yes, because let's go back to that. I was actually um, just finishing my PhD uh, at Stanford, and I had the privilege of working at Xerox Park, okay. just because my advisor was joint there. Great. And what was so great about Xerox Park at the time is it gave you a sense of what things were going to be like in the future. Mm -hmm. You felt like the future had already arrived at yeah. Park, and we were getting to see it a little bit early. And what really struck me was that all of the world's records were going to go digital. And yet there was no way to tell an old digital record from a new, new one. one. A tampered bit from an untampered bit. Sure. And I started to think, what's going to happen historically when all we have are digital records and there's no way of knowing where they belong, where they came from, how where they, they belong, exist. how old they yeah. are, whether they were just changed a few seconds yeah. ago or whether they've been around for a hundred years. And I just thought, someone needs to attack this problem. Mm. I don't know anything about the space because I'm coming out of physics, but by coincidence, I landed my first job in the computer science laboratory at Bell Communications Research, awesome. where they had this very strong crypto group. Mm -hmm. And I went down and had a chance to meet uh, Dr. Haber, Stuart Haber, and I said, I don't know how to solve this problem, but this is going to be a big problem. Yeah. And if we could get out ahead of it and solve it before other people that are smarter than us start to worry about it, we could really do something significant. And so he said, well, great, let's start working on how do we f create immutable records? Because the idea in the past is that all records were on some sort of medium and you could detect alterations by what happened to the medium. But we had to find a way to make the data itself immutable, independent of the medium. And so we worked on this problem for several months and we came up with what I would call a kind of engineering grade solution mm. to the problem. Mm -hmm. But the real th issue for me was, I said, this still requires us to trust somebody. We've got to make this trust free. Mm -hmm. And so Stuart, being the kind person that he was, said, okay, let's work on it a few more weeks. Let's see what we can do. Finally, he got to a point where he said, Scott, you know, there's, I think it's pretty clear there's no way to build a trust free system. Okay. So why don't we salvage the work we've done? Because I want to get a paper published. Okay. And just write a proof about why you can't build a trust free system. Okay. And so we started working on this proof of why you can't build a trust-free system. And it, it, it involved all of these layers and layers of, well, if you had two people colluding, how would you get a third person to prevent mm. those two from the, colluding? Kind of like and the Byzantine. Then, and then we worried, well, what if there were three people? What if you 
What if you brought in the person that was trying to oversee the prevention of the two mm -hmm. colluding so that it, yeah. it was the third? And I said, there's a reductio ad absurdum here. We're gonna, the, the only way you could solve this would be if you had the entire world colluding. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that that That's was in fact it. the solution. <laughs> that was the solution. And in a sense, we have So you stopped writing that paper. Right, <laughs> and so we stopped writing the proof that it couldn't be done and said, and then if we create a, a conspiracy so large that everyone in the world is in on it, then we have in fact inverted the problem and solved it. Thank you for really sharing that story. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's lovely, lovely to hear that you, you, you're working on a, a justifying that something cannot be done and that obviously starts to play with the mind and like, okay, but really, truly, it's like if you really, really believe that you can like innovate a, something, and you keep on trying to move around it, one way or another, it will come And out. I'll tell you what drives something like that. And this is for anyone that considers themselves a fellow entrepreneur or innovator with me along the path. The reason I was confident that there must be a way to do it was if there wasn't, then we were going to have a huge problem. And I just couldn't picture a world where we had that problem. Mm -hmm. So I said, there's just got to be a solution. And my advice for people is that you shouldn't worry that you don't have the background to begin with. If you feel strongly about a problem that you want to see solved so that you can have the world that you want, you should simply find a way. Nice. Um, very, very nice. Because that's, that's how things get done. Very nice. Can we talk a little bit um, about your session at the Malta Blockchain Summit? Right. And uh, your um, very inspiring as well uh, act there where you've put everybody on blockchain, kind of. Sure. So, you know, the talk was called Blockchain the Long View. And my argument was I might not have a superior perspective to others, but if anyone has a long view on the blockchain, it's probably me. And we talked about what's truly fundamental to the blockchain as opposed to what's uh, secondary. Because if we think in terms of fundamentals and try to understand something from a historical perspective, we are in much better position to predict what's actually going to evolve over time. And so what we did was, we, it, as a way of trying to demystify what constitutes blockchain, we created a blockchain instantaneously in With the room them with every person in the audience that had access to a smartphone. There you go. I created the Genesis Block Live. Everyone was able to come in permissionless and each um, made a prediction. And then we froze the record and distributed all of the backbone of the blockchain to every single participant in the room. That's great. And we will be able to know what the outcome was November 1st 2019. Next year. Yeah. Next year, in um, a year's time. Wonderful. So um, I think it, it gave people that came to the summit a kind of digital memento that they could take home. They, they hold the community power in this blockchain, every single person that's that so, uh, so participated in it. And, and I think that that's kind of the next also part of the next layer as well of, of what we're seeing now is like I, I, I think my, my listeners probably getting bored of me harping on about the user experience within the space but for mass adoption like like Scott has been saying it, it, it cannot just the technology the blockchain part of it is really really let's that the part needs to be left to the geeks and the nerds and the people who really can understand all the technical stuff it's the user experience what brings upon that That's right. that will enable consumers to really say you know wow my shopping experience is much better my banking experience is much better they don't need to understand yeah because this is there and this is there and it sits somewhere here right. and you know it, it's just you not know, important i've i've, I've gone through hundreds of technologies as a consultant. Try, I spent a lot of time working for universities, some venture capital firms, helping and private research labs, helping them to assess technology that's coming out of the lab and whether it has a chance of flourishing in the mainstream. And so often you meet these very intelligent people who think they're presenting a business plan, but in fact, what they're presenting is a science fair project. They want to go on and on and on about 
what's so intricate and interesting about the technology. And I used to tell people like that, you get one slide for the technology. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the rest of it has to be, what is this compelling what's user experience what's in for me? that is willing to take someone from the way they're doing things into a new and untried way because it's so much better. And until you can make that case for me, you've got a science fair project, not <laughs> um, a, you know, a, a product. Yeah. Uh, so so nice to <laughs> so nice to hear you say that because it's uh, I I've seen a fair few few pitches in my life as well, um, and uh, one of the things that always th always throws me is like really like the first presentation pitch that you get from a startup, them just going into way too much detail, and then you get to the end of the deck and like okay so how are you going to actually get the money right. Uh, make money, sorry, and how are you going to do your public distribution? Like, how are you going to distribute right. and What's blow this out? Channel? Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience as like maybe some, some closing thoughts and, and feelings or, or, or maybe inspirational sure. points? Sure. Um, I, I, again, you're, you're, you're making a big mistake by giving me an open-ended question because <laughs> I, can, I can talk forever. But I think people miss the point if they don't see that in democratizing trust, that we are opening up the possibility to creating more empathetic social networks. And the real value creation, in a fundamental sense, is that we become a kind of ecosystem where free and fair exchange allows kind of all ships to rise. Mm -hmm. As we come to better understand the individual contributions that the entire community mm -hmm. makes mm -hmm. and incentivize it accordingly, we can make flourishing ecosystems. Thank you so sure. much for Happy coming to onto here. the show. It's been amazing to meet you in person and chat. Um, it's been lovely to have you at the, the Malta Blockchain Summit. Um, I think that lots of people have been certainly inspired by your, your exercise on stage, myself included. Um, and I wish you all the best in the endeavors yeah. moving forward with uh, One Partners and, uh, and everything that you've contributed to this, to this ecosystem and this community. Thank you very much for Great. being part of the inspiration. All right, thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you've been just as, as inspired as myself. Um, if you like what you have heard, please do share this video. Feel free to like and subscribe. Um, remember that everything that you share, it just builds stronger uh, confidence and, and knowledge in this space. Have a lovely afternoon and I'll see you very soon.